Hello, welcome to USC's Financial Aid and Managing the Cost of Attendance video. My name is Kimberly Guerrero, Assistant Director of Outreach here at USC's Financial Aid Office. Throughout this video, we will be covering the ways in which you can cover your educational expenses during your time here at USC. During the first portion of this video, Maricel Campos with the Student Financial Services Office will cover important information regarding available payment options. Later, I'll return to discuss additional information on next steps for students to receive their financial aid. With that, I'd like to welcome Maricel to begin our presentation. Thank you, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Maricel Campos, and I'm representing the Student Financial Services and Cashier's Office. A quick overview of the information we will be covering today. We are going to cover two types of accounts, the student account and the payment plan account. We will discuss the different financial offices located on campus, the cashier's office, student financial services, and financial aid office. Each office will offer different services and roles for students during their time at USC. We will go over the steps on how to pay your bill, including payments with a 529 plan, prepayment plan, employer reimbursement, monthly payment plan, and wire transfer options. We will also review how to receive financial aid, including loans, and how to receive a refund whenever there is available credit on your student account. Every student has a student account. Your account is tied to your USC ID number, the assigned 10-digit ID on your USC card. This account will reflect all your financial transactions at the university. It is important to know that this account is protected by Family Educational Rights and Privacy Acts, or FERPA. This federal law protects the privacy of student education records, and only third parties that are granted access by the student may be privy to any financial, educational, or medical information. So we highly recommend openly communicating with family members or third parties on access and correctly following the steps to grant access if you wish to do so. If you know that you would like to authorize a guest user on your account, you may grant financial access through USC ePay, and we will show you how to complete this later in the presentation. Guest users on USC ePay will receive monthly billing statements and will have their own login credentials to access their student's financial account. You may also grant access to key educational information like courses, grade information, and medical records through OASIS. The advantage of authorizing guest users, for example, parents will allow our department to discuss details related to the student account with them directly. E-bills will be generated monthly and are only available electronically. You may find these statements in your USC ePay. USC ePay is the University Secure Electronic Service for Managing Your Student Account. And through USC ePay, students will be able to view their charges, view their balance, make a payment, and view their billing statements. Whenever a billing statement is generated for the month or there is a new activity on the account, the student as well as the authorized users will receive an email notification. We recommend getting into the habit of reviewing these monthly billing statements and ePay in general to keep your student account balance current and to avoid any late fees. And to give you a heads up, we are currently updating our billing statement format to add more features. Now going back to the billing statement example, you will notice in the top right corner of the document, there is important payment information. It includes the day the statement was generated, the billing period that is being shown, and the student ID number. It will indicate if there was still a balance due from the previous bill, and it will indicate what is due this billing period and on what day. At the bottom of the statement, you will be able to see all the transactions that have been included. Charges will indicate anything that is charged to your student account, for example, the tuition and fees. Credits will also be shown in the statement, and the credits may come from scholarship, other financial aid, or will indicate if a payment has been made towards a balance. The statement will provide a clear transactional record of the student account. As with any bill, you want to make sure you are top of the due dates to avoid any additional late fees. 
Important today to remember when paying your bill will be the settlement deadline. The settlement deadlines are the dates that tuition and fees must be paid in full. If your financial aid is delayed and may not cover the amount by the settlement deadline, we do not expect you to cover the amount that financial aid should be taken care of. In these instances, some planning and calculations will be needed so you are just paying the correct amount to be settled. Kimberly will be going over this information more in depth, but on the USC FAST page, there is an online planning worksheet that does those calculations for you. It will identify the charges on the student account and the anticipated aid, leaving you with the balance you should pay before the settlement deadline. Late settlement fees are assessed at $100 per week for the first three weeks after the deadline. If there is still a balance on the account after the three weeks, late fees will revert back to the 1% monthly finance charge on any past due amount. It may be helpful to know that the settlement deadline is typically the Friday before classes begin, and you may also refer to the registration calendar online under the schedule of classes or the student financial services website under dates and deadlines. Again, it would be best practice to regularly check your USC ePay to confirm that you are prepared for upcoming due date. So you reviewed your statement and you are ready to make a payment. There are three ways you can submit payment. The first is the USC ePay, which we have already briefly discussed. Students can make a payment with a checking or savings account. It is important to remember that we do not accept debit or credit cards for payment. We also suggest that when you enter your account information, please verify that the routing and account number are correct to avoid any return fees. You will also have the option to initiate a wire transfer payment with Flywire or Convera or you can enroll in the domestic or international payment plan. We offer international payment plan options that are available through Flywire. You may also pay in person at the USC cashier's office, either at the University Park campus or at the Health Science campus. They accept check, cashier's check, money order, or cash as a form of payment. Lastly, you may pay by mail. The checks will need to have the student's ID number and are payable to the University of Southern California. All checks sent via mail should be addressed to the cashier's office. And if you hope to use this method, please ensure that the checks are sent out in a timely fashion and will be received before the due date or settlement deadline. If you decide to use the USC ePay, there are two ways you may access your account. You can log into your MyUSC portal and find ePay in the Pay My Bill tab or you may log in to OASIS, which will require your USC ID and the six-digit PIN as your password. Under Financial Information, you will see the Pay My Bill, and it will direct you to the USC ePay site. This is also the location where you may grant third-party access to your account information. You will need to go to the Other Services tab to set up this access. The overview will provide a quick snapshot of the status of the student account. You will see the current account balance, the next due date, and the minimum payment due for that due date. As previously mentioned, the student and authorized users will receive email notifications when the monthly billing statement is ready to be viewed. You can view these statements in the Statement tab and download it for your convenience. If a student or authorized user are ready to make a payment, they may do so through the Make a Payment tab. It will request the amount you would like to pay as well as the method of payment. The options will be to use personal checking or savings account or wire transfer via Flywire or Convera. Next is the Transaction tab. You can see recent transaction listed in this tab. ePay will be the location students can set up an account for their e-refunds. You may set this up through the My Account tab. And for students that are interested in enrolling in the payment plan that we offer, you will set it up through this tab, and we will be covering the specifics on payment plan in a few more slides. And you will also be able to set up guest user access and to authorize the Title IV funds. Under the My Account tab, we'll have student information and the payment information. The checking or savings account you set up will be shown in the payment method section. You may update this payment at any time 
And again, we always recommend that you make sure this information is entered correctly. This will be the location where students grant a third party or guest user access to their student account. Students will select the send a pay invitation and enter in the information of that user. This is also where students can enroll to the direct deposit refunds to receive refunds electronically and where students can sign the Title IV authorization to authorize the university to apply federal financial aid proceeds such as Pell Grants, Cal Grants, SEOG, Blast Loans, or direct student loans to pay charges related to a prior or future term. We recommend setting up an account with a direct deposit refund to promote a paperless environment and it is often a quicker method than sending refunds by mail. To enroll to our direct deposit refund, you must designate a checking or savings account number to receive an electronic refund. E-refunds are usually processed within two to three business days, whereas mail can take up to 10 business days. Keep in mind that if you are a payment plan member, you will not be able to receive a refund until the payment plan has been paid in full. If you do receive a credit, but still have a remaining balance on the payment plan, you may contact our office to apply that credit directly to the payment plan. You may also choose to leave that credit in your student account to be available for future. Now that we have taken a look at USC ePay and its features, we are going to look into the payment plans. Payment plans are available to all students for the fall and spring semesters. Summer payment plans are only available to graduate or doctoral programs. The payment plan is a great option for students that may not be able to pay the entirety of their bill in one lump sum before the settlement deadline, but can afford it split into five separate payments spread out over five months. It's a line of credit with zero interest. However, there is a $50 enrollment fee to set up a payment plan. When you enroll, you will enter the amount you would like to have the payment plan for. The amount will be split into five equal payments with the first installment and $50 enrollment fee due upfront. It's important to remember that you will need to enroll each semester if you are interested in utilizing the payment plan option. The fall payment plan runs from August to December and the spring payment plan from January through May. All payments will be due the third of every month. For the domestic payment plan, you will set up auto pay that will automatically deduct from your ACH account the third of every month. While the international payment plan does not have an auto pay feature, students will need to initiate the payment each month. Please be mindful of these important dates to enroll in our domestic and international payment plan. It shows the first and last date you can participate or enroll in the USC payment plan to avoid incurring any late fees. If you are interested in enrolling in the domestic payment plan, you will be able to do so through USC ePay. On the left-hand side of the website will be the payment plan tab we have already mentioned. To enroll in the plan, you will be asked to select the payment plan and enter the amount that you would like to pay on the plan. You may enter the entire balance on the student account or a portion. And again, if you are anticipating financial aid, you may need to calculate the balance you will need to pay and enroll that amount. The amount indicated will be divided evenly into five payments, which will decide the amount of each installment. Upon enrolling, you will need to pay the $50 enrollment fee as well as the first installment fee. As we have discussed, the remaining four installments will be due the third of every month. For the students that would like to use the international payment plan, you will have to log into your MyUSC portal. When this plan becomes available online, there will be an international payment plan icon as indicated in the lower right hand of the page. If you do not see this option, but are an international student, you can also search for it in the search engine. You will be directed to a page that looks like this. Just like the domestic payment plan, to enroll there's a $50 enrollment fee and the first installment will be due upfront. Each installment will be due the third of every month. If you have enrolled either in the domestic payment plan or the international payment plan and you have over or under budget the amount, contact our office and we will be able to adjust the payment plan as needed. And as we have mentioned earlier, you will need to enroll every semester for the payment plan.
Some families may have set up a 529 plan to use towards tuition and fees. A 529 plan is a tax advantage savings plan where funds were set aside for college expenses. There are two types of these plans, a college savings plan and a prepaid plan. The college savings plan allows you to access funds as needed, and if you have this type of plan, you will need to reach out to your plan administrator directly and have them send a check directly to the university. In this case, please follow the pay-by-mail instructions included in this presentation. We also have the instructions available on our Student Financial Services website. Prepaid plans generally pay a specific amount per unit of enrollment and may also pay a portion of student housing. This will typically require direct invoicing from the university. So if your plan requires direct invoicing, you will need to contact agency billing to coordinate the invoices being sent. If you visit our Student Financial Services website under the Agency Billing tab, we will have a list of some of the common prepaid plans that require invoicing for you to review. And in two slides, we will have more information on agency billing. Some students may work for a company or organization that helps pay for tuition. In this case, they may request an employer reimbursement Student may be eligible to defer up to 90% of tuition if the employer agrees to reimburse the student at the end of each term, and if the student account is current. There is a $100 service charge for processing unemployment reimbursement. It is USC policy that a student must pay at least 10% of tuition and 100% of all fees before the settlement deadline each term. Like the payment plan, you will need to request employer reimbursement every term. As we mentioned earlier, agency billing is the department that will handle invoicing. So if you are sponsored by a company, you may be eligible to have all or a portion of your bill invoiced directly to the sponsoring agency. They will also handle vouchers or letter of authorizations each term. Veteran student will need to contact USC Veterans Certification Office or may reach out to a certification officer to inquire about applying benefits. USC also offers tuition prepayment plan. This plan enables you to lock in the tuition and mandatory fees at the current rate, therefore avoiding the 3% to 5% increase of tuition every year. There is a minimum payment of two years to enroll in this plan and the maximum is five years. Keep in mind, this program requires payment for the full amount of tuition and mandatory fees upfront and does not allow for a reduction based on scholarship and other financial aids a student may be awarded. This plan does not typically work well with aid recipients. Since we do not offset the cost of scholarship, if the student is a scholarship recipient, the scholarship will only be refunded after the contract of the prepayment period ends. So if you are interested in this plan, you will complete the online inquiry form that is found on our Student Financial Services website. Under the Payment Options, you go to the Prepayment option and complete the form. Once the form is submitted, our office will send you an email with a prepayment contract for you to review and sign. Payments for this plan must come from a physical check or wire transfer. And if a student were to leave you a seat for any reason, you may cancel the contract at any time and an unused principal on their plan will be refunded. Finally, the last topic I will be going over before handing it over to Kimberly will be the tuition refund insurance. This fee is automatically charged and is about $100 per semester. It is optional. You may opt out when you are registering for courses. The deadline to opt out is the third week of class and you may do so through the tuition refund insurance tab and following the prompts. Tuition refund insurance provides a refund of tuition and fees to a student who must withdraw from all classes due to an illness or accidental injury. Tuition refund insurance protects the significant financial investment a student makes in tuition at USC. And with that, I will pass the presentation along to Kimberly, who will go into details on the financial aid portion. Go ahead, Kimberly. Thank you, Maricel. During the second half of this video, I'll be covering information about the recommended next steps for students to receive their financial aid, as well as managing and financing the expected family contribution. After you have applied for financial aid, you will receive what is known as a financial aid summary. 
Included in this summary is a cost of attendance, which is also abbreviated here on the screen as COA. The cost of attendance is an estimate of how much it might cost you to attend your program. However, it's not necessarily what you are going to be billed for or what you are going to pay directly to the university. It's a budget that helps our office determine how much financial aid a student may be eligible to receive throughout the duration of their program each year. The cost of attendance is not limited to just your tuition. It also includes other expenses that you may come across that are associated with being a student. For example, tuition and fees, which are paid directly to the university, are referred to as direct costs. You then have other expenses that you may come across, such as housing, dining, books and supplies, and transportation, which are known as indirect costs. You may be able to utilize your financial aid to assist you in covering some of these indirect costs throughout the duration of your program. Something to note here, though, is that the personal expenses allotment within your budget is meant to serve as a budget for your basic day-to-day -day living expenses. It is not meant to take into account personal consumer debt, such as credit card payments or car loans. Now, I'd like to demonstrate how tuition is calculated. At the graduate level, tuition is based off of your enrollment each semester. It's also important to keep in mind that in order to be eligible for financial aid, students must be enrolled at least half-time. On the screen underneath their respective charts, you will see what is considered half-time for both master's and doctoral students. For master's students, you will need to be enrolled in at least four to seven units to be considered half-time. For doctoral students, you will need to be enrolled in at least three to five units. Students who are enrolled in up to 14 units will be charged for each individual unit. Here on the slide, you will see the current academic years per unit rate. Students who are enrolled in between 15 to 18 units will be charged using a flat rate. This academic year's flat rate tuition charge is listed here on the screen. Here, you can see what your tuition charge would be if you were enrolled at least half time for both master's and doctoral students. Again, at least four units for master's students and three units for doctoral students in this example. Additionally, the screen also shows what you can expect to be charged for tuition for one semester if you are enrolled in 10 units, which is considered full-time for graduate students. Students who are enrolled in 15, 16, 17, or 18 units will be continued to be charged for the flat rate as long as they stay within the 15 to 18 unit range. Tuition rates are updated each fall semester, and you can always confirm the current per unit rate and flat rate at classes.usc.edu. As I mentioned previously, in addition to tuition, the cost of attendance or your budget also includes estimates for other costs associated with being a student. Here, we have a sample cost of attendance for a student who is planning to enroll in 10 units based off of the upcoming academic year's rates. It's important to know that when we are creating your cost of attendance, it's always in collaboration with your academic department. We seek feedback from your academic department to be able to calculate the estimate of how much it might cost you to be enrolled in your particular program. Estimates for books and supplies are going to depend on how many units you are enrolled in. The more or fewer classes that you are taking, the more or less that you may be budgeted to spend on books. Here on the screen, you will see what we estimate a student's books and supplies may cost them when enrolled in 10 units. Housing and dining costs are going to depend on your individual situation. As you can see, there is a budget for a student who is planning to live with their parents or relatives in the middle column of this chart, and there is also a budget for a student who is planning to live on their own. For a student who is living in either USC or non-USC owned housing, we anticipate that they will be also paying rent. Therefore, the student may have a higher budget compared to the student who is living at home with parents or relatives. It is important to keep in mind that your financial aid as a graduate student is primarily in the form of loans that you will be financing your program with. The more that you do to keep your living costs low, the less financial aid that you may need to borrow and repay with interest. Another important note to consider is that when we estimate a budget for your housing and dining throughout the academic year, it will be only based off of your period of enrollment. Let's say that you're planning to take classes only in the fall and spring semesters but you live off campus and you sign a one-year lease which runs for 12 months. 
you may need to develop a plan on how you're going to take care of your rent that you will need to pay while you're not enrolled for classes because you will not be eligible to receive financial aid for a semester that you are not enrolled in. Some students may consider subleasing or budgeting themselves well enough to ensure that the financial aid that they receive during the fall and spring semesters will also assist them through the summer. Your personal expenses budget is based off of a modest standard of living and is not meant to cover your credit card or car loan payments. Therefore, we recommend keeping your personal expenses low so that you may borrow less financial aid that you need to repay with interest. As I mentioned previously, when we create your cost of attendance, it is in collaboration with your academic department. Depending on your individual circumstances, your actual costs may differ. You may have actual tuition, fee, or housing costs that are higher than what we have estimated. If this is the case and you want to ensure that you may receive enough financial aid to cover your actual costs, you may submit an online appeal form to update your cost of attendance through your FAST portal. This appeal form is located in the document library of your FAST portal. For example, if we have estimated as a full-time student, you will be enrolled in 10 units, but you are actually registered for 12 units, you can update your cost of attendance to include those two additional units. Other students may need to purchase a computer to begin their program or have childcare costs. Another good example is USC Health Insurance. Students are automatically charged for USC Student Health Insurance. However, if you have your own insurance, you can submit a waiver. If approved, you won't be charged for the USC Student Health Insurance. However, let's say you end up keeping the USC Health Insurance. This is an example of an educational expense that will show up on your bill on ePay but it may not be included within your cost of attendance. You can note this in your appeal to include the cost of USC student health insurance in your cost of attendance. It's important to keep in mind that when you submit the appeal form to update your cost of attendance, it increases your loan eligibility. Be careful and mindful to only borrow what is needed so you can minimize the amount that you must repay with interest after your program ends. At USC, there are a variety of ways to manage your costs throughout the time of your program. First, we recommend that you determine how much you can pay as a one-time payment up front by the settlement deadline. You can then consider signing up for the university's payment plan, which is a great short-term financing option. It's an interest-free line of credit that allows you extra time to settle your university bill over five monthly installments. If you do plan to use the payment plan, students can sign up each semester online through Student Financial Services. After exploring these first two options, if there is an additional amount that is left to be covered, we then recommend that you consider long-term financing options to cover your educational expenses throughout your program. Long-term financing options might include federal student loans and or private education loans. As a general rule of thumb, we do recommend that students exhaust all of their federal loan options first before considering private loans due to the fixed versus variable interest rates and more favorable repayment terms. However, we do want to help you make an informed decision, so the next few slides will help to cover your loan options in more depth and include your next steps if you do plan to borrow, so you know what action items to take care of by the settlement deadline. To determine your loan eligibility, we take a look at your total cost of attendance and subtract any merit-based aid, such as scholarships or grants, that don't need to be paid back. What's left is how much financial aid you may be eligible to borrow. Based off of our previous example, you can see here on the slide what the student may be eligible to borrow based off of their semester's cost of attendance and amount of merit-based aid that they are receiving. If you don't have any merit-based aid now, and if you take out your full loan eligibility, and then let's say you get a scholarship later, we can send the money back to your lender so that way you don't need to repay that portion. A second point on the slide is that you are not required to borrow the full loan amount that you might be eligible for. Many times, when students are first starting their program, they log into FAST and they see their cost of attendance and they think that's the amount that they need to pay to the university. That's not necessarily true. As we mentioned, your cost of attendance includes both direct and indirect costs, so it's not really accurate if you want to know how much you need to pay on your bill which is why we have the planning worksheet that I'll go over in a few moments. A good recommendation is to figure out how much you can pay up front. Maybe use a portion of your financial aid to pay your tuition and fees, and then maybe use your personal resources to settle the rest. Sometimes, students might use their financial aid to pay their bill in full, 
and also have some money left over to help cover their living expenses throughout the semester. It really depends on each student's individual circumstance. This is why we highly recommend the planning worksheet as a resource to calculate your budget and determine how much you may need to borrow. If you receive more money than what is due on your bill, after your bill is paid in full, the money left over can be issued to you as a refund, which you can then use to cover your living expenses. We recommend that you sign up for direct deposit on ePay so that you can receive your refund sooner rather than later once your bill is paid in full. The first federal loan that I will cover is the Federal Direct Unsubsidized Loan. Unsubsidized means that interest accrues from the day that the loan is dispersed to your account, meaning that as soon as the loan disperses, you will begin accruing interest on that loan each month. While you're enrolled in school at least half time, you can defer the interest payments until after you graduate. After you graduate, your lender will contact you to let you know how much interest did accumulate. And at that point, you can either decide to pay that down or off before any unpaid interest that has accrued is added to your original loan balance. The current interest rate for the unsubsidized loan is listed here on the screen. For most graduate students, the maximum amount of unsubsidized loan that may be included in your financial aid summary is $20,500 per academic year or a maximum of $10,250 per semester. This is an annual loan limit that is set by the federal government. It's also important to know that the federal direct unsubsidized loan has what is called an aggregate loan limit. For most graduate professional students, the maximum amount that students might be able to borrow in this type of loan throughout their entire educational history is up to $138,000. $500. In addition to interest, there is also an origination fee that is deducted off of the loan before it's dispersed. The actual maximum amount of unsubsidized loan that might disperse to your account in a single semester after the origination fee might be about $10,142. This is just something to keep in mind while you are calculating how much you might need to borrow in this type of loan. The planning worksheet does a great job including this calculation. I'll show you what this looks like in a few moments. However, the origination fee for the unsubsidized loan is listed here on the screen for your reference. Although rare, it's also important to know that if you are currently enrolled in or are attending another institution during the academic year, and if you are borrowing the unsubsidized loan at that school as well, the $20,500 annual loan limit is split across the board. The second federal student loan option that might be available for students if the first one is not enough to cover your costs is the Federal Direct Graduate Plus Loan. This is a second federal loan option that you may access. It's not going to be initially listed in your FAST portal when you are looking at your financial aid summary. Students do need to submit another application to be able to apply for the loan so that we may determine their eligibility. The current interest rate and origination fee for the Graduate PLUS loan is listed here on the screen. Again, that origination fee is the amount that is deducted off of the top of the loan before it is dispersed to your student account. There are a couple major requirements that students will need to meet in order to apply for the Graduate PLUS loan. To be eligible to borrow the Graduate PLUS loan, you must first have exhausted the federal student loan option that I mentioned first, the Federal Direct Unsubsidized Loan you must request to borrow the maximum of this loan first. Once you've requested to borrow the maximum unsubsidized loan and you still need additional funding to cover the rest of your costs, then you can apply for the Graduate PLUS loan. In addition to the requirement of having to borrow the maximum of unsubsidized loan, there's another requirement that students will need to meet in order to apply for the Graduate PLUS loan. When you apply for the Graduate PLUS loan, you will need to meet certain credit criteria. Once you have submitted your application, your credit history will be checked. As long as your credit history is free from any of the adverse items that are listed here on the slide, you may be eligible for the Graduate PLUS loan. They aren't looking for any specific credit score, nor is there an income to debt ratio required. They are just checking to see that your credit history is free from any of these adverse items. If you have been denied for a Graduate PLUS loan, one option may be to pursue an endorser or co-borrower who does meet the credit criteria and is willing to co-sign the Graduate PLUS loan with you. As I mentioned already, we do recommend that students exhaust their federal loan options first, but we do understand that everybody's situation is a little bit different. So if you are considering private educational loans, we want to make sure that you can make an informed decision. 
With private loans, there are variable interest rates and eligibility requirements and repayment terms are different compared to the federal student loans. Private educational loans are not eligible for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program as well, so there are a lot of key differences between both loan options to keep in mind. However, if you visit our website and navigate to the loan section under Private Financing, there is a helpful tool called Elm Select that allows you to view private educational loans that USC students have borrowed from within the last three years. This tool allows you to compare different private loan options, see which one might be best for your particular situation, and through that same website, you can submit an application and that private lender will work with our office so that we can certify it as a private educational loan. Again, just visit our website, it's listed here on the slide, to access this tool to view different private loan options that may be available. Now I'd like to go through important next steps for your financial aid. For students who have not already done so, and if you'd like to access your federal student aid, we highly recommend that you submit your financial aid application as soon as possible. The first step is to be sure to submit a free application for federal student aid, also known as FAFSA, by visiting studentaid.gov. It usually takes no more than five business days for our office to receive your FAFSA. If it has been longer than that, there are cases where we may need to do a manual search for it. A lot of the time what happens is your USC general student account doesn't have your social security number, and that's the piece of information that we use to link your FAFSA with your USC account. If it's been longer than five business days and your FAFSA portal continues to request you to submit a FAFSA, please contact our office so that we may manually search for your application and get that squared away. After you submit your FAFSA, the second step to apply for financial aid as a graduate student is to submit a financial aid supplement form. This is an online form that is available in the document library of your USC FAFSA portal that allows you to report your enrollment and housing plans for the academic year. We use this information to determine your budget or your cost of attendance, which we saw earlier. Helps us to determine your financial aid that you may be eligible to borrow for the academic year. Once we have your FAFSA and your financial aid supplement, we then use that information to create your financial aid summary. And once you have that, you can see your federal student aid eligibility. That's when you can request your federal direct unsubsidized loan, as well as the federal direct graduate plus loan, if you are planning to borrow those two federal direct loans. If you are only looking to borrow private educational loans and not access any of your federal student aid, then you only will need to submit the financial aid supplement form in addition to your private loan application. Now I'm going to go over how to access the financial aid supplement form. To access your financial aid supplement form, the first step is to log in to your My USC account and under the My Services section, click on the financial aid button. Once you click on the financial aid button, you'll want to click on the red hyperlink that says FAST which stands for Financial Aid Summary and Tasks. You'll then want to select the current academic year. Scroll all the way to the bottom and you should see a set of links available. Click on the document library link and select the same academic year. You'll see a list of online forms. These are forms that are not necessarily required of you to submit, but rather they're there for you in the event that you need them throughout the duration of your program. The very first form that is listed is the appeal form, where you can update your cost of attendance if you have actual costs that are higher than what's estimated, as I mentioned earlier. Down at the bottom of this picture on the screen, there is the financial aid supplement form. Once you click on it, it will ask for information regarding your enrollment and housing plans, your program, your anticipated graduation date, and whether you'll be a full-time or part-time student or live at home with relatives or on your own. Again, we use this information to create your financial aid summary and determine your financial aid eligibility. It's important to know that whatever you fill out on this form must match your actual enrollment plans. If it doesn't, there may be a delay in your financial aid being released and applied toward your bill. So for example, let's say that you submitted this form a few months ago and you initially thought that you were going to be a full-time student and you reported that on the financial aid supplement form. But now, let's say your plans have changed and you're going to just be part-time. That's okay, you can always resubmit this form. Just be sure that whatever you fill out on this form is as up-to-date as possible and that it matches your actual enrollment in order to avoid any delays in receiving your financial aid to pay your bill on time. Once you apply for financial aid, we provide you with a financial aid summary so that you can see an estimate of your costs, which is not going to be your bill. It's just a budget to determine how much financial aid you are eligible for. 
Within your financial aid summary is also where you can access the planning worksheet that I mentioned earlier, but I'll show you that in a moment. If you click on each individual semester, a gray bubble pops up that shows you what you reported on your financial aid supplement form. So, if you did forget what you put down on your financial aid supplement form, you can always log on to FAST, click on the spring semester for example, and it'll show you what units and housing plans you indicated previously. Your FAST page only shows you what you were eligible to receive. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are automatically applying your loans to your bill. There are additional steps that you will need to take in order to actually receive your loans. For the unsubsidized loans, there are three steps that you need to take. First, you need to request the loan. So out of the 10,250 that you may be eligible for, complete the direct unsubsidized loan request form, which allows you to indicate how much you actually would like to borrow. The loan request form is found in the document library of your USC FAST portal. Next, you will need to go to studentaid.gov to sign a master promissory note, which is the contract of your loan. It provides you with important information regarding what it means to borrow your student loan, including how interest is calculated and repayment terms. The master promissory note is good for 10 years, so you'll likely only need to sign it this first time you are borrowing the loan. Finally, you'll need to visit iGrad, which is a financial literacy tool, to complete an online module that takes about 30 minutes for an entrance loan counseling course. Once you have completed these action items and you've requested the full amount of unsubsidized loan, and let's say you still need additional funds to cover the rest of your costs, that's when you can apply for the Graduate PLUS loan. The application for the Graduate PLUS loan is found on studentaid.gov under the Apply for Aid section. If your application is approved, the second step would be to sign your master promissory note at studentaid.gov as well. These are two different types of loans, and each loan requires its own master promissory note. Once you've completed each of these steps, the earliest that we can release your financial aid will be 10 days before your classes begin. When you log into FAST, the great thing is, you can usually get a lot of your questions answered by navigating to this Aid Status tab. If you are wondering when your aid is going to be dispersed, or if you are missing anything or have to take any additional steps to receive your financial aid on time, you can look on this Aid Status tab for that information. It shows you the disbursement date, informs you if there is an action item or step that is missing, and it gives you the direct link to complete that action item. So, if you ever have any questions about your USC financial aid, we highly recommend that you log on to your USC FAST portal first because it's likely that you'll be able to answer your own question just by logging into FAST and navigating to the Aid Status tab. If you log into FAST and click on the Planning Worksheet tool, you will be able to see your bill and your financial aid all on one page. This is convenient because you can see exactly what you will have to pay and under the Additional Resources section, you can indicate whether you plan to make a one-time payment, interested in the payment plan, or if you plan to borrow your federal student loans, so you can see exactly how much you might have to pay or may have to borrow. It does the calculations for you, so it's a great way to develop a plan on how you're going to settle your bill. It is only for planning purposes, however, so if you indicate that you plan to borrow your federal student loans, this doesn't mean that you are actually going to borrow them you will still need to take those additional steps that we just talked about earlier in order to receive your loan money. Once you click Next, the planning worksheet gives you what those additional steps would be so that way you can utilize those additional resources. The planning worksheet is only available after you register for classes and once your bill is available. If you have not been charged for tuition and fees, the planning worksheet is not going to be available. If you do see charges on your ePay account, it's likely that the planning worksheet will be available for you to access. Another great resource that we have for students is iGrad. iGrad is an award-winning financial literacy tool that we've partnered with where students can learn about many different financial literacy topics. We found that students enjoy two of the features on iGrad, one being the free scholarship search engine where you can continue to search for outside scholarship opportunities. These scholarships are all vetted by the company so you can be at peace knowing that these scholarships are legitimate opportunities that you are investing your time to apply to. The other popular resource is the Federal Student Loan Snapshot. If you are borrowing federal student loans, you can upload your federal student loan information onto iGrad and it will give you a breakdown of what your federal student loan repayment may look like. This is a really great way to manage and track your federal student loans. To access iGrad, visit usc.igrad.com and log in 
with your USC Net ID and password. This is just a friendly reminder that students will need to reapply for financial aid every year. Students, please make sure to pay close attention to the Financial Aid Office email notifications and check your USC FAST portal regularly. You will receive email communications from our office. However, please make a note of the deadlines listed here on the screen, so that way you can ensure that you are applying on time for financial aid each year. This is just a brief summary of everything that we have gone through today to serve as a checklist for you. If you have not already done so, make sure that you determine whether or not you would like to establish a guest user to anyone who may be supporting you throughout your academic program. Now that you are planning to enroll at a university, your student email should be checked often and should be your primary email that you use when interacting with any departments at USC. Also, review your charges on ePay if you have already registered for classes so that way you can see how much you are being charged for tuition and fees. Please utilize our planning worksheet. Again, it's a simple and easy way to calculate how much you might need to borrow to settle your bill. Now is also a great time to begin completing those additional steps if you are planning to borrow your federal student loans and determine what payment options you might be using to pay your bill by the settlement deadline. If you are interested in signing up for the payment plan, you may do so online through Student Financial Services. We also recommend that you regularly review your ePay account each month and check for any billing statements in case there is any new activity on your account. That brings us to the end of the presentation. We hope that you have found this information helpful in understanding your financial aid and how you may begin planning the ways that you will cover your costs throughout the semester here at USC at the undergraduate level. If you have any questions, our contact information for both of our offices is provided here on the screen. On behalf of Student Financial Services and the Financial Aid Office, thank you for your time. Fight on!